um, to the webinar, uh, Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness and Response that the Global Parliament of Mayors and the Geneva ah. Cities Hub organized for Mayors today. My name is Caroline Schep. I'm the Executive Director of the GPM Secretariat in The Hague. And I'm very proud to welcome you to this webinar with presentations and discussions on pandemic preparedness, a topic that is on the agenda of the Global Parliament of Mayors since 2018. That is before the COVID pandemic began. At that time in 2018, the mayoral debates on this very theme were guided by, guided by Professor Rebecca Katz, Director of the Center for Global Health Science and Security of Georgian uh, University. Very happy that Rebecca has been able to join us uh, today for this webinar, as well as Professor Ilona Kikbush of the Global Health Center at, of the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva. Welcome. I wish you all a very informative and inspirational event. And without further ado, I will give the floor to your moderator of, of today, Antje Duong, co-director of the uh, Geneva Cities Hub. Over to you, Antje. Thank you so much, Caroline, for those welcome words. Um, so, as you said, I am today representing the Geneva Cities Hub. And for those who don't know us yet, we are an organization that seeks to better connect local and regional governments to Geneva-based multilateral processes in different fields, be it human rights, humanitarian affairs, migration, refugees, digitalization, and of course, health. So I'm very pleased that we're collaborating with the Global Parliament of Mayors on this um, briefing for mayors. So as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that cities often bear the brunt of emergencies and that they are frontline responders. It was indeed mayors who implemented national measures to contain the spread of the, vir the virus. It was mayors who informed their population, who identified, protected, assisted those in needs, reorganized urban mobility to limit social interaction, and also took measures to facilitate socioeconomic recovery in their cities. So as states have embarked on diplomatic processes to ensure that the world may better prevent, prepare, and respond to future pandemics, it is important to involve mayors. Acknowledging the role of mayors and including their perspectives in the current intergovernmental negotiations is crucial to ensure that we realize a whole of government approach for more effective pandemic prevention, preparedness and response to ensure that local governments will play their part in the implementation of the diplomatic outcomes of those processes and above all to ensure equity not only among states, but within states themselves, thanks to the action by subnational government. So the objectives of this briefing today are, one, to brief mayors about those current WHO intergovernmental processes, and we'll speak in particular about the new pandemic treaty, as well as the revision on the international health regulation. The second objective is to illustrate why we want to support the involvement of mayors in these processes based on their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the third objective is to, you know, as a concrete outcome of this meeting, we would like both the Geneva Cities Hub and the Global Parliament of Mayors to introduce a declaration to be signed by mayors for better pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. So the declaration calls upon states to acknowledge the role played by local and regional governments to ensure that the instruments that are being negotiated right now also rely on the whole government, whole of government approach. So we hope to gather as much support as possible for this declaration before sending it out to member states, the WHO Secretariat, calling upon them to take into account mayor's perspective, who are very well placed to contribute to effective pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. So without further ado, let me turn to our distinguished speaker. And first, um, I will turn to Professor Ilona Kikbush. Um, you're the founder and the chair of the Global Health Center 
at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Your whole life basically has been dedicated to shaping global health in partnership with WHO, states, NGOs, but also with city. Since you were a key instigator of the WHO Healthy Cities Network. So, Professor Kickbush, please give us an overview about the pandemic treaty currently discussed among states. What are the main issues discussed and which issues in particular are relevant for local and regional governments? You have the floor, Professor Kickbush. Thank you very much and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted uh, to be in contact with cities again, as you mentioned at one stage, it was a very major part of my life as we moved forward with the WHO Healthy Cities movement. Uh, I hope we can put up my slides uh, and uh, I would like you to, to actually take you back as you hopefully see in a minute. Will we? Yes, uh, could you go to, yeah, if you go to the next slide, please. So I'd actually like to take you back to uh, 2003, because in 2003, when uh, the SARS pandemic hit, something became very clear. It became clear that pandemics not only hit the global south, but that they hit the global north it became clear that cities played a major role as, for example, transportation hubs, because what one experienced with SARS and Toronto was uh, that uh, a person had flown from Hong Kong uh, to Toronto, where there was a large uh, Chinese community. And what became very clear was there had to be more clarity around the role of the WHO as the then Director General, uh, Dr. Brundtland, uh, actually had uh, declared a travel advisory in relation to Toronto. And uh, that led to quite a lot of conflict. Uh, some of you uh, might know the stories around that. But the really serious thing that happened, and Rebecca will be talking about this, that this finally led uh, to opening up again the stalled negotiations on the revision of the international health regulations. So the SARS in 2003, 20 years ago, led to the international health regulations, a very, very important also treaty, you could say, that the WHO has in relation to pandemics. If we could go to the next slide. Dr. Brundtland was also the director general that then used the WHO constitution uh, that allowed for WHO to have treaty making powers. This is very relevant in relation uh, to the so-called pandemic treaty because for the first time, Dr. Brundtland uh, convinced the WHO member states to move forward with Article 19 of the WHO constitution that the member states, the World Health Assembly has the authority to adopt conventions or agreements with respect to any matter within the competence of the organization. This was the first international treaty negotiated under the auspices of WHO. It was adopted in 2003 and went into force just two years later because it was so widely, widely embraced uh, in the member states. So for many of the countries that are now negotiating around a pandemic treaty, they are looking back in history very closely how the negotiations went forward for the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. What we saw here is that what had been practically impossible before to have a global treaty during the Cold War was now possible in a different political environment, but that it also needed a very courageous director general to move down that road. You'll see on the next slide that uh, 20 years later, uh, the notion that uh, we need a treaty uh, in relation uh, to pandemics came forward uh, as a challenge to all levels of government. Could we have the next slide, please? Yes. 
And uh, the arguments, of course, seem very clear to us, but they have built up over uh, the last uh, couple of decades that uh, obviously a pandemic, no single government or institution can address this threat, that uh, there were a number of weaknesses in the response. So there needs to be a legally binding agreement between countries and a belief that if one had such an agreement that dealt not only with the response, but with prevention and preparedness and went in quotes beyond uh, the international health regulations would enable countries to strengthen their capacities at all levels. And what you can see is that the focus is very much on uh, political engagement, on having a clear definition of tasks and processes, and to have the integration of health across all levels of policy making. And it was in 2020 that the European Union first made the proposal for such a treaty and was followed by 25 other heads of state to move it forward. There was quite a long discussion actually whether WHO should embark on such treaty negotiations, whether such a treaty should even be negotiated under the auspices of WHO or uh, under the auspices of the UN in general. But then, and please let's move to the next slide, it was agreed that the negotiation should happen in the context of WHO. You see here the two co-chairs and the bureau that is leading these negotiations, which is called the International Negotiating Body, the INB. It was established in December 21, has since been working, has had a whole number of meetings, and after a number of conceptual texts, uh, to outline what such a treaty could look like. The Bureau has recently uh, presented a text that is available in all official languages of WHO and is uh, the focus of negotiations that are going on as we speak. One of the issues is, and Rebecca will be referring to that, that in parallel a decision was taken to revise the international health regulations and uh, there are opportunities that emerge from that, that allow focus, but there's also problems, particularly for small countries, to be on top of all these negotiations. And there's always also the danger of what we call regime shift. That is, you don't get one issue in this negotiation, you move it over to the next, you move it back, and you even move it to a third arena, which I'll come to in a minute. Very quickly uh, on uh, my next slide, and uh, it's already been referred to, that it was very, very clear from the early days of the pandemic that cities are in the front line, that uh, they uh, really need to be involved. They really need to also benefit, I would say, from such a treaty. And it is absolutely essential what I think you are partly doing with this declaration uh, that mayors show leadership in this area uh, because uh, they are major contributors, but also if a pandemic treaty, if the IHR do not work, they pay the price. They pay an economic price, a social price. Uh, and uh, this is something that needs to be looked at very closely. Two issues are very much in the forefront of the treaty negotiations. If we could go to the next slide, you also mention it in your declaration. Uh, the key focus is equity. Equity, obviously, because the experience with COVID showed very clearly that there was a drastic north-south divide, that one could not rely on international solidarity and that vaccine nationalism stood in the way of progress for many of the developing countries. Now that of course was also reflected very much all around the world in high income and in low income countries around local inequities. And you see here a picture of the local COVID-19 situation in Mexico City, for example, that shows you uh, those inequities as to uh, 
where uh, people were subject to the pandemic, where you had the highest rates of death. And it's only, and you mentioned that by addressing those underlying issues of inequality at the global, national and local level, that we will be adequately prepared uh, for the next pandemic and be able to manage it accordingly. But of course, and I refer to that on my next slide where we uh, focus on the next uh, area of the treaty negotiations, and that is the focus on governance. I took up contact with the co-chair of uh, the pandemic treaty negotiations of the INB, Dr. Precious Matsotso, and told her about this presentation. And I said, what are the key issues that are relevant to cities and mayors? And she, of course, said that mayors, and you find these points here, are absolutely critical in building the political momentum, particularly also in relation to adequate funding, both from the global and the national level, that they can help push the national commitment and that at local level, they can lead the charge on whole of government and whole of society approaches that they can lead the charge on facilitating equitable access and build the capacity at the local government. And we think here particularly of the public health capacities that are so necessary. And fourthly here, we have again linked to other public health capacities, city-based surveillance systems and ensuring an integrated approach with the context of what we call One Health. And within the negotiations to the pandemic treaty, there is a big discussion around this One Health interface of human health, animal health and climate health, which is becoming more and more central. So uh, to come uh, to an end, uh, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity. Already we are entering what we call uh, the circle of panic and neglect. When this treaty was uh, proposed, everyone felt an enormous sense of urgency to move forward. Uh, there is a feeling now sort of two years later, well, you know, uh, how quickly should we really be doing this? You'll remember the promise was that the treaty uh, should be adopted in 2024, in May at the WHO World Health Assembly. That is very close, very much around the corner, not even a year to go there. And we have three processes that are happening at the same time. That, as I said, could be an opportunity or could get in the way of each other. One is in September, a high level UN meeting, a pandemic summit that will come up with a political declaration. There are the negotiations on the pandemic accord, the pandemic treaty, and there are the negotiations on the IHR amendments. In an ideal world, they will be fully complementing each other and uh, helping us to move forward. Uh, yet uh, it is uh, significantly complex and uh, we will see the extent to which also geopolitical divisions uh, come in the way. Uh, you will know that not all countries are similarly committed, for example, to transparency and accountability to issues that are absolutely critical uh, for the treaty because the experiences with both SARS at the time, but now again with COVID-19, were the lack of adequate information, of early information, of transparency, and following that of accountability. Accountability to the international community, but accountability also of each government in how it has fulfilled its international obligations and its obligations to its uh, communities. Again, I underline that strong local public health fun functions and structures are the absolute cornerstone as one thinks of the agreements uh, uh, of, of the IHR and the treaty, they need to be implemented where people, as we say, live, love, work and play. And unless that happens, we will not be prepared, we will not be able to respond and we will not be ready 
to face the next pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kigbush, for this very comprehensive overview about the pandemic treaty. I think you really underline very well the crucial role by local and, uh, local and regional governments. As you said, the cornerstones is about local, local public health infrastructure. And I'm particularly uh, grateful that you basically uh, talked about our initiative um, on the mayor's declaration to the chair of the intergovernmental negotiating body, you know, calling on her basically attention to local and regional governments in the process. So thanks for that. Stay with us. We now move um, to our next distinguished speaker, who is Professor Rebecca Katz. You are the director of the Center for Global Health Science and Security at Georgetown University. Professor Katz, much of your life has also been spent on enhancing global health governance and security, including um, as a senior advisor on the global COVID-19 response and global health security for the US Department of State. So Professor Katz, the global implementation of the international health regulations have no secret for you. You've worked many years on that subject. So please tell us more about the revision of this of those regulations, which has not made it to the headlines as much as the pandemic treaty. Why do states want to revise it? Why is it linked to pandemic prevention, preparedness and response? And what's in there for local and regional governments? You have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, first, I, I just want to say how grateful I am for the opportunity to be with all of you today and an honor to be on this panel. Um, I will do my very best to follow Dr. Kickbush. Um, you are, you're going to hear some very similar themes uh, and which I think um, kind of underscores the, 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 the there's, a, there's a kind of similar ideas that are emerging around what is happening with global governance and the negotiations and all the movement that's happening at the, at the global scale at this point to think about pandemic preparedness and response. Um, as Carolyn mentioned at the very start, um, five years ago, way before the COVID pandemic, I had the opportunity to deliver remarks at the Global Parliament of Mayors meeting in Bristol. Um, in an intervention titled Urban Pandemic Preparedness, A Call to Action. And during that October 2018 intervention, I noted that um, most city mayors and other municipal leaders have traditionally not been engaged in pandemic preparedness or disease resilience initiatives, despite the vital role that cities play in the response to and recovery from outbreaks. And I ended the intervention noting that um, the, the GPM and other networks present unique opportunities to foster new alliances, as well as to capitalize on existing partnerships, knowledge, experience of mayors around the world to contribute to the development of international, national, and local policies for pandemic preparedness, and to try to ensure comprehensive and resilient urban health strategies are in place. And that these activities are necessary to prepare and equip urban environments with the necessary tools prevention, detection, response to pandemic disease. The year later, in 2019, at the Durban uh, meeting, our intervention actually used urban outbreaks of measles to focus attention on the importance of preparedness at the local level and to try to push for the development of intra-city mechanisms to efficiently share information, experiences to facilitate emergency response. Only months later, we then saw how critical it was for cities to share not only best practices, but also to band together for purchasing power and to coordinate policy implementation. This coordination among cities can be particularly effective in places that have similar jurisdictional authorities. So if mayors can align with other mayors who also have decision-making control over things like non-pharmaceutical measures like quarantine or school closures, or, how, or are in charge of, provisional, of, of provision of clinical care, they can learn what works and what is less effective. They can also share best practices for taking care of their populations when the jurisdictional authority for certain critical actions lies with the national government and how they may be able to influence actions. And we as a global community uh, are now focused on trying to rebuild and strengthen the architecture for global governance of disease 
in an effort to improve pandemic preparedness and response. So Professor Kickbush explained where we are in the development of the new international agreement on pandemics. But as she mentioned, this is just one of many lines of efforts to try to strengthen pandemic preparedness and response. So as you are all now aware, the World Health Assembly member states have been negotiating potential amendments to the international health regulations. Um, that was last the last iteration adopted right after SARS, as Alana mentioned. The first change agreed to was actually a process amendment that would allow future amendments to enter into force after one year instead of two. This is in the weeds, but it's part of the process. Um, the current plan is that the final text of amendments would be ready for consideration in May of 2024. This is an ambitious timeline. Um, and as noted, we are we're currently sliding very quickly into the neglect part of that panic and neglect cycle. But, but it does look like it might be doable. I think the major areas of work seem to be focused around issues around notification and verification of events, the process for declaring public health emergencies of international concern, and how to potentially deconflict with that with a process for declaring pandemics, mechanisms for issuing emergency recommendations and other coordinated response activities, whether to institute um, something like a conference of parties type regular review process or a similar type of mechanism to try to monitor implementation and adapt to evolve the changes in the field. And critically, issues of equity. Um, so as you've just heard, equity is um, an important word in the negotiations and is probably the most important word in global health security today. Alona already discussed this as the key focus of the treaty negotiations. It's important to note that there are seem to be a number of lower and middle income countries that are actually only willing to continue negotiations if equity is appropriately addressed. This in practice means that some version of um, access and benefit sharing, addressing intellectual property rights, access to medical countermeasures, this may also be linked to proposals on a, a new article, article a, a new, new language on um, Article 44A, which would be to establish a financial mechanism for equity and preparedness and response. The language is still being negotiated, but the proposed Article 44A may or may not explicitly be linked to newly established pandemic fund which currently uses the IHR related metrics, among others, as indicators of needs and success. I mention this because it's particularly important, the revised metrics for the International Health Regulations capacity building have been expanded recently to more robustly reflect the need for capacity at the subnational level. And as you all know, your cities need that capacity to prevent, detect, and respond, which will then often require Either, either or technical assistance as well as financial resources. So this is a key area where subnational entities can underscore the need for resources to strengthen pandemic preparedness response capacities as well as networks. There also remains major issues of um, overlap or deconflicting, um, as as Alona mentioned. There's there are a lot of things moving all at the same time. There are some nations that think it's maybe best to push their agendas in all of the fora and, and see what sticks. Um, there's others that are, are taking a more strategic um, approach of, you know, this is a topic that should go here, this is a topic go here. It, again, there's a lot of swirl and there's a lot of trying to figure out where things will land. I think a few other points to quickly add. As mentioned, in addition to the ongoing negotiations, there will also be that high-level meeting at the UN General Assembly uh, in September on pandemic preparedness and response. Nations are currently negotiating the language for the declaration, but it will just be that, a political declaration. There's nothing binding on nations. But that being said, this declaration is, an important, is important for underscoring the critical, nation, the critical nature of subnational entities. There, there is currently proposed sentences that have been added by the EU um, that to, to include the word subnational 
things like phrases like strengthening political will at the subnational, national, regional, and global levels to respond to pandemics. It's also proposed at the word subnational around supporting healthcare workforce. This, this process is moving quickly, but there are still opportunities to ensure that the political declaration acknowledges the importance of subnational activities in pandemic preparedness response. Um, I believe the circulation of the next version of the text is scheduled for July 18th, so in just a few days. Um, and then the final text will be placed under silent procedure on July 26th with the adoption on September 20th. This is, there's also a bit of a time crunch right now on the international health regulations. So the fourth meeting of the, of the working group will take place uh, starting on the 24th of July. Um, and then there's supposed to be a joint session between between you and the IHR that's supposed to take place on the 21st of July. So again, very shortly. Um, so the time to speak up and become engaged is now. So let me let me end there um, because I'm I'm very much looking forward to hearing hearing the mayors who are here today and and uh, be part of a discussion on what's next. So again, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Professor Katz, for all the explanations about the you know the main areas that are being revised in the context of the international health regulations. I also take you on the fact that we can still hopefully um, influence the political declaration that will be adopted by states at the high level uh, general assembly meeting on pandemic preparedness prevention and response i think it's it's september in september during the high level week of the ga so what we could do also um, is to send basically a message to co-facilitators of the declaration to support basically um, the fact that local and regional governments should be acknowledged somehow in the text and that the words subnational should be maintained. So thanks for that. Let me now turn to um, our distinguished mayors to also share their experience basically on the ground uh, with pandemics. So we'll start with Mayor Jennifer Arndt. Um, you're the mayor of Fort Collins, uh, north of Denver in Colorado, USA, and you've been a mayor there since April 2021, really in the midst of the pandemic. So as a mayor elected right in the middle of the pandemic, how did you engage your local population to provide it with accurate information and to ensure that they would adhere to rules that limited social interaction and to vaccination programs as well? Mayor Arn, if you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, well, I was elected in 2021, that's true, but I had served seven years. I was in the middle of serving my terms out as a state representative. So I came in with kind of a unique perspective between the state and then now new to me, the local government, although this is my hometown. So um, that was kind of an, uh, an advantage because, of course, the state was making a lot of rules that then um, our county, which is the bigger political, and then our city within the county. So um, it was a it was very tricky. Uh, first of all, I'll say um, I wanted to echo. I, I, I was very impressed with Doctors Cookbush and Katz for really. Um, actually, you said a lot of the things that feels like you you feel you see us. <laughs> Like you talked, and I also appreciate uh, for people in politics a, a good getting in the weeds for the amendment to allow faster amendments. That's very good. Um, so I appreciate the, the technical level of the talk. And I could go through sort of a long list of our responses, but um, I think they're not so different from what other mayors probably experienced. So with the limited time here, I might just jump to some of the challenges because what was highlighted before was this need for um, collaboration, alliances, and then coordination, right? And I will speak from the, not just American perspective, but the Western American perspective, is we had a governor who didn't want to do a stay-at-home order, and then eventually did. And then we had a county that was very aggressive, uh, which I thought was the right thing to do. And then we had the, those things came down to be pressure at the local level in terms of sometimes we get very conflicting advice. Sometimes we get conflicting mandates. And then we had our school district and my childhood friend was president of the school board during this time. So we would often meet and just be like, oh, because we were the two on the, like 
li living out the front lines of the orders coming to us. With, I will say, um, sometimes dispersed government is a strength and in, in a global pandemic, it's very much a weakness uh, because we had a lot of resistance. We had a lot of non-compliance and we had a lot of misunderstanding in terms of uh, which you can't blame people for, but our transit system, we, we made it free. It also had a mask mandate much longer than we did because it's federally subsidized. So there was um, a lot of aggression and anger about these things. And so this is the, the main fight we we're fighting was the social context, right? The vaccine was brilliant. The, the rules, you know, were there and it's always going to be. And I think that's the piece that mayors around the world will share in that sort of feeling of, of uh, to different degrees. Um, so I could go through some of the challenges, but that, that was the basic one. We had a big, huge anti-vax rally right here in my hometown and thousands of people came. And of course I went out to see who was there and speaking and what was happening. Uh, people were surprised to see me there, <laughs> but I feel like you need to, to listen to what's happening. Those were the challenges. Some of the innovations that came out were Colorado State University's here in uh, Fort Collins, and it has a very strong One Health initiative. And they were really early in testing the wastewater for COVID and some other uh, really quick to respond types of things. So it was a pleasure to have uh, what we consider as a world-class university right here helping us along and collaborating with us. Uh, we also, uh, it blew through a lot of the rules, the things that you thought would always have to be, like you couldn't eat outside in Fort Collins because who would eat on the sidewalk? Well, all of a sudden we have, of course, outdoor dining, we have the liberalization of a lot of things, right? Which uh, some of them have stayed. Uh, so we had people opening their minds. We also had we have a hard time citing cell phone towers for lots of things I won't go into. Some people on the left don't like the look of the tower. Some people on the right think that 5G is going to kill you. But we have all these competing things. And all of a sudden, we had mobile cell towers all over the town helping the school children have access equity, right? Which leads to the point that we're I'm trying to get to is the equity part. And of course, there's the global equity question, which is real. I lived for six years in Mozambique, and then I was Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco, so I'm very sensitive to those issues. But my role as mayor, I was sensitive to our local equity issues, and that had to do with broadband speed for school children trying to access. That had to do with the governor quickly developed an app for your vaccine. I was like, <laughs> you know, that's not going to do it, buddy. You, got, you have to, you know, take mobile units to the people. So we, we, we really were on the forefront of that. We also were on the forefront of just, it boosted up our translation services from zero to 60. So um, everything was in Spanish. Everything was trying to be as accessible as possible to every single person, which, which had been very positive things. But, um, and it's interesting when people can move quickly. So I'll just think that I'll wrap that up because I want to hear from the other mayors, but those are some of my reflections. And um, the, you can't underestimate the power of these sorts of issues. And right now coming together with alliances, collaboration, because what's really going to hurt us is um, the lack of cohesion and to response. And uh, that'll be a, a matter of trusting local, local, state, federal, and national, international um, agencies, which is, I think, the work, at least in our country now. One more piece about the inequity is the biggest counties in Colorado who are the resistors, they suffer the most. They had the highest death rate. They had the lowest vaccine rate by, by choice. They had um, uh, the most, and they're still really suffering to come back. They had the biggest economic impact. Uh, so. Um, there's all sorts of equity issues to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Arndt. I mean, I think you really kind of illustrated why we need to have mayors involved in those processes. You talked again about coordination at different, you know, government levels, community, community engagement, 
and going down and talk to people, basically equity issues, you know, you, you mentioned really the Spanish translation, which I find really fascinating. That's a kind of a simple measure. It costs, it costs something, but it really basically fosters equity so that everyone can understand, you know, the right information. So thanks for that. Um, thanks a lot. Stay with us. We now will turn to the Southern Hemisphere, uh, Mayor Manuel de Aroche. I, I hope, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but forgive me for that. You're with us. Um, you are the mayor of the city of Keliman, which is the fifth largest city in Mozambique. And you've been the mayor for more than 12 years. And you're deeply involved at all levels uh, on urban and climate change issues and have taken key roles in international city networks, including the Global Parliament of Mayors, of course, as member of its executive committee. So, Mayor, um, the COVID response, including the distribution of protection equipment, such as masks, gloves, and, and many others, but also vaccines, unfortunately was the object of much inequality between the global north and the global south. And it's been mentioned earlier, I think, by Professor Kickbush. So how did this manifest in your city? How did you provide protection to the most vulnerable in Kiliman? You have the floor, Mayor. You need to unmute yourself, Mayor. No, we can't hear you. You're still muted, Mayor. Oh, okay. You now it's okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I did, I really want to thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, very distinguished uh, panel. Of course, I mean, I want to also to say that I, I was very happy to have the surprise that uh, Mayor Arden, to know that Mayor Arden, she works in Mozambique. So I hope we can use this opportunity to link ourselves and see what uh, her city and my city can do together in this regard. Oh, well, coming to the topic and to the question you, you assembled to me, First of all, uh, I, I want to say that uh, the issues that you raised, they were very common to most of the uh, southern or the global south cities. One was lack of resources, lack of vac vaccines, lack of uh, medical personnel, and uh, lack of logistic facilities to distribute. And also, but also we, we, though there were these common issues, it's uh, very important for us to differentiate what happened in most countries with what happens in two different countries. One, which was the US in the North with President Trump and Brazil uh, with uh, President Bolsonaro, because those they were national government who were kind of uh, denialists, like, you know, they were not working to local government. And in the case, both of, uh, as I know, of the U.S., like the U.S. Conference of Mayors and uh, the Union de Prefeitos, or Frente de Prefeitos of Brazil, they took a very important role in pushing uh, for more accurate and I think more state-to-heart measures. In the case of Brazil, which are part of the Global South, the mayors are faced what was mentioned by an earlier speaker, which was the confrontational and uh, somehow uh, differences in terms of tasks in, uh, in, in the legal framework, because the federal government in Brazil had some issues, had some powers, the state governors have other powers, and the city governments had uh, powers. So sometimes those would issue different and confronting rules. And this really, like, you know, is something that should not happen. We need to work out and to learn from that experience and try to find out uh, how can we better synchronize both national, uh, federal, and uh, municipal issues. I think that is something that we need to learn from and really make a, 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 a improvement. Because I think many of or some thousand of people lost their lives because, for example, drivers 
they will leave one state in Brazil, moving to the other, and they couldn't move forward because there were federal laws allowing them to go. And then you will find mayors who will say, who will they, like put their cities in quarantine, which really like have had, uh, uh, an impact in the economy, but also on the health of people. Well, coming back to Mozambique. Uh, in Mozambique, we have uh, something called Decree 33 Stroke 2006. This decree by the national government, which was approved in the year 2006, uh, states that in local or in areas which are governed by mayors, where there is uh, an elected government, both prim uh, primary education and primary health should be managed by the local authorities. Unfortunately, in spite of this decree by the current government, I mean, by, by the government, ruling government, being approved in 2006, it has not been applied to the municipalities. Only Maputo, which is the capital of Mozambique, they got some uh, health unit, primary health units where they manage. So the issue of health in most of the municipalities in Mozambique, it's not in the hands of the mayor of the local government. However, the, the, the pandemic showed to the national government that they needed us. And this gave us power over the, 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 the local people because we were, there, we were like uh, in the front line and we were quicker to take measures and to respond to challenges that were posed to the pandemic better and in a faster way than the national government. So this gave us like, you know, a, a kind of uh, a certain advantage, which we really used to promote prevention measures, but also to assist people who were in need. Fortunately, I think for two main reasons. First of all, in Africa, I think that uh, the people, with the exception of Egypt, Egypt and uh, South Africa, the rest of the African countries, the African countries did not suffer, like in terms of death and, and so on, as compared to Europe, because population in most of African countries is very young. Uh, the age like uh, is like about 55 to 60. And also, the, I mean, people live, live in, in, in a very dispersed way. So, I mean, we don't have like, uh, of course, you have big, big cities like Maputo or Beira, where, where like you can see that um, the number of people living in a square meter, in square met, meter or kilometer squared, uh, it's, it's, it's very high, but normally people live you know, distance in a distance. So it helps to like, you know, mitigate, if we, we want to use that word, then and, and actually bring down the number of people who were affected with the pandemic. So what we did was to seize this opportunity to show and to prove to the local government that actually we as mayors and local government we are not only closely, but also we are more efficient in responding to challenges, not only like the pandemic, but also, as you may all know, on the 12th of March, 2023, my city was uh, struck by a cyclone. And also we were there on the first minute and we were the first there. So like with these two events, we managed to prove and to convince, I think, to the central government that they need to take into consideration the strategic placing of local government and mayors in dealing not only with the pandemic, but also with natural disasters. 
Thank you so much, Maya, for that. We heard you loud and clear. Indeed, you're much quicker and more efficient. And that's very much the reason why we want to push you know, states at the international, not only at national level, I think, but at the international level also to acknowledge your role, basically, in responding to public health emergencies, but also, as you said, many kind of other disasters. Um, thank you for that. Now, let me turn to Mayor Ricardo Rio. You are the mayor of the city of Braga in the north of Portugal since 2013. My God, it's been 10 years already. You're very active at the international level. We know you well. Um, you've been you know, closely associated with EuroCities, the OECD Champion Mayors Initiative, the Council of Europe, ICLEI, and now, of course, you've been recently elected as the chair of the Global Parliament of Mayors. And we're looking forward to also welcome you in Geneva uh, at the third edition of the Forum of Mayors in October. So, Mayor, I've referred to it at the very beginning of this event. One of the objectives today is to launch a mayor's declaration for better pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. So please, Mayor, tell us why should cities demand more from their national governments and from international organizations such as the W um, such as the World Health Organization, sorry. What are cities demanding through this declaration? You have the floor. Oh, thank you, Anne. As you mentioned, it's been 10 years and the time goes by very swiftly when we are doing the things that we like. And a uh, special greeting to my dear colleagues, uh, Mayor Jerry Arndt from Fort Collins and also from my colleague from the GPM XCOM, Mayor Manuel de Araujo from Kelly Mann, and also to our Secretary General, Caroline, and also to Dr. Lona and Dr. Rebecca Katz. Rebecca and I'll start with that because um, it's, it's a, real, a great pleasure to participate in this session uh, together with the Geneva Cities Hub. But it is, I think, it's a, even a, a bigger satisfaction that I have for listening to Dr. Rebecca Katz and um, raising the awareness that this topic didn't begin at the GPM level with the COVID. It was something that we had a lot of prior interventions. She mentioned the Bristol, she mentioned Durban, and uh, together with her and other uh, specialists, we have been working this dimension of the pandemic preparedness and the role of cities in health issues uh, for a couple of years already. Obviously, the, the pandemic has been this uh, situation and has created specific uh, challenges for all the cities. And uh, before that, if we look, for instance, at the reality in Portugal, in my country, uh, cities don't have a very direct responsibility in health matters. Health is an issue that is at level government. It's the government that manages the hospitals, the first care of uh, the citizens. And uh, we have, let's say, a subsidiary um, role in providing some specific um, replies to the needs of our population. But that, I think, even increases more the difference of the importance of the, the role of cities throughout the pandemics. And in Portugal, like in every single country worldwide, we had uh, all these challenges that we had to deal with, for which we weren't prepared, of course. It was a major shock that we had to deal at a very uh, quick uh, and to have a very quick response. And uh, we were faced with uh, some uh, lack of organization at the national level, at the regional level, and I, I have to say it, it's, there's no two ways of, of saying this thing. Uh, if it wasn't for the role and the, the work done by cities uh, throughout the pandemic, the situation will have been much worse than it was uh, at least uh, in all the realities that I know. And I think that's a, a, real, uh, a situation that happened worldwide. Uh, and obviously we were responsible for doing what wasn't supposed to be attributed to the cities. Uh, in Braga, for instance, we provide a huge help directly and indirectly to the health um, sector. We provided um, individual protection equipment from masks, gloves and other um, materials uh, to uh, logistic support in terms of transportation, in terms of uh, inhabitation, for instance, for doctors there or nurses that didn't want, to, didn't want to go to their homes and stayed in places provided by the municipality and providing meals for the professionals that couldn't live 
the health centers in providing specific equipment like the ventilators that was in need uh, for, for giving support to the more serious uh, cases. And it was also through the municipality and the partnerships with the private sector that were managed to buy a lot of uh, equipment to the local hospital. But we had an even bigger uh, role in providing the tests for um, retirement houses, for health professions, uh, for citizens that were more exposed to the um, contamination. And also, we also played a huge role in the organization of the distribution system for the vaccines. Braga was quite a successful example of uh, the organization, obviously in coordination with the national level, as responsible for providing the vaccines. But in terms of the logistics of the organization of the service, we were considered probably one of the best centers of vaccination in Portugal, and we had a huge rate of uh, adhesion from our citizens. And that was obviously something very important to assure the return to normal to normality as soon as possible. And, and in all these examples, what I have to stress is that it was at the local level. It was even not being earlier prepared and having to deal with all these challenges that we managed to coordinate with the private sector, with the citizens, like the mayor from Fort Collins mentioned, with the uh, national organizations from different areas, from the health uh, minister to the social uh, support inst uh, minister to the employment minister, because apart from these topics that I mentioned that are more directly connected with health, we had also to give social support. We also fostered the economy. We supported the economic agents and so many other issues that we had to deal throughout that period. And this is to say, and that's the, the role of the declaration as well, that cities are at the forefront of the pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. And that uh, we have unique insights into the needs and challenges of our communities, as well as the ability to respond swiftly to emerging situations like the one that happened in COVID. However, until now, cities have not been involved in designing nor implementing adequate response. And that's why we call for multi-level governance, because this is essential by demanding more support we are fostering greater collaboration with national governments, with international organizations, enabling the sharing of best practices, the lessons that we learn, the technological advancements in pandemic prevention and response that are available worldwide in connection with the specific knowledge centers that are spread throughout the territories. And this collaboration will obviously ensure a more effective and coordinated global approach to managing future pandemics that we are conscious that will come. Sooner or later, we have we will have more problems like the ones that we had to deal with a couple of years ago. And the declaration also calls on states to acknowledge the centrality and vulnerability of cities in pandemics as densely populated areas and to acknowledge the centrality of urban planning. And if therefore calls on governments to enhance support to states in terms of resources, expertise and capacities. And that is why we are obviously very uh, committed to support all the work to follow up the declaration. As it was already mentioned, it will be shared by the Geneva Cities Hub with the World Health Organization, with member states, as well with facilitators uh, at the UN General Assembly in September. And also uh, the Geneva Cities Hub will also uh, share the mayoral declaration as an input into the intergovernmental negotiations on the pandemic treaty and the revision on the international health regulations to be adopted at the 77th assembly of the World Health Organization that will happen in May next year. This to wrap up uh, is to say that uh, this declaration is aligned with the specific challenges that all the mayors have to deal with in our daily work in terms of um, it's the health issues, and uh, that's why I would like to invite all the mayors to sign the declaration for better pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response, and to support the work that has been done by the Geneva Cities Hub to spread the word all over. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Rio. Indeed, um, we're very much relying on mayors like you, very much engaged, basically, to sign and support the declaration. Um, uh, the work really has been done by both the Geneva Cities Hub and the Global Parliament of Mayors. And indeed, the declaration has been approved by the Executive Committee of the Global Parliament of Mayors and will now be open to signatures for um, 
GPM, sorry, the Global Parliament of Mayors, mayors to ratify through the virtual parliament. And also let me specify that GPM mayors will be able to comment on the content of the declaration had we forgotten something in there or simply to, you know, provide suggestions on the language that is in there. And simultaneously, other mayors will also be able to become signatories of the declaration um, through the link, I think, that will be provided in the chat um, of this event. Let me then finally just tell that the declaration will also be posted on both our respective website of the Geneva Cities Hub and the Global Parliament of Mayors. Um, so that you know it's promoted and everyone is aware of this and we'll make sure that we convey it to all relevant stakeholders. Mayor Rio, I just wanted to say that I really like the fact that at the very beginning of your intervention, you mentioned that you know health might not be you know the core responsibility of cities in Portugal, but nonetheless, your city has been and others basically have been involved in the response because the pandemic does not only of course, was not only a health issue, but it affected and impacted all areas of life. And therefore, cities were there basically to engage the communities and do all those little things that are usually invisible, but that we try to make visible in particular with this declaration. So thank you for that and for your contribution. We're coming to the end of the panel as such. Um, and so I wanted to open the Q&A session, see if there are people online who ask questions. I believe there's already one that is online. Um, and I'm not sure who raised the issue, but it was someone asking, uh, referring to the fact that mayors grapple with the effects of COVID, and, but that central governments do not allocate extra resources. And that's also one of the things that is being contained in the declaration, asking for resources to also trickle down at subnational level so that all local and regional governments can do their part of the work, basically. So um, there was a question about how can the global parliament of mayors help push for it at the national level? I'm not sure if Caroline, do you want to give a try to this question? Well. That is a difficult question. Um, not, I don't have an answer just like that. Mayor, Mayor Rio, can you help me? So, how can mayors, you know, influence the national government through this declaration? Is that the question, Ansel? Yeah. Well, that was not a specific reference to the declaration itself. But I, I think asking how can international city networks help push, um, you know, for extra resources at national level. And indeed, I think it's a difficult question, but I think international city networks, but also national city networks probably have a role in that. If you want to, do you want to add something about this, um, Mayor Rio? Or just others? just um, giving a concrete example. The fact is that uh, to, in Portugal, all these uh, investments that we had to do and that I mentioned in my prior intervention, were mostly covered by the local budgets. We had even the promise of the national government to support local authorities, both the municipalities and the parishes, which is a lower degree of um, power in the administrative level, uh, to support and finance their, their efforts with the preparedness for the pandemic. But the amount that was transferred in the end was a short part of the investment made. And so uh, this is very, very important because this leads to inequalities. Not all the municipalities have the same resources of the city of Braga and not all have the same side and capacity to respond. And we don't want a, a, an asymmetric response in the whole territory. We want to have a balanced approach in which nobody is really left behind. And therefore we need to have this transfer of resources from the national level to the local level where it can be more wisely and more quickly and more efficiently applied. Well, uh, can I get it? Go in, go in, Mayor. Well, thank you very much. I just wanted to second what uh, my president, because I'm a member of not only of the global parliament of mayors, but also a member of the executive committee. So we approved indeed the, the, the declaration. And uh, first of all, I wanted to invite uh, as uh, the mayor 
of Braga Mayor Rio uh, did, all the mayors really to join us so that because the more mayors signed the, the declaration, I think more power and more influence mayors will have. First of all, we need to make this statement very strong that mayors are on the forefront of uh, uh, challenges like not only the pandemic, but also not, not natural climate change disasters. You know, when these disasters come, we are there. We cannot run away. We are the first to face it. We are the first to come up with answers and we are the first to deploy resources. Even, and sometimes this, this needs to be underlined, even when those resources have not been budgeted for. And this was the case uh, in Mozambique and in, in, in Kilimanjaro with the pandemic. Because from the central government, we, we, we received a single penny. We did not receive a single penny. And uh, we had otherwise to implement measures, be it in terms of uh, running on state and other private media outsources like to explain to people what they should do, how they should prevent, but also going door to door. My as a mayor, I had to go door to door to explain to people that that was like the only mean I had in my, in my hand. But of course, institutions like the Global Parliament of Mayors can help a lot. For example, even at the bilateral level, because the former mayor of the global, I mean, the former president of the Global Parliament of Mayors who is Mayor Peter Kutz of Mannheim? I mean, on a bilateral level, because he saw, he understood the challenge that Kilimanjaro was facing, he was able to raise resources, about 10,000 uh, US euros, to send to my city, to Kilimanjaro, to help us. So it was not like a, as a group, but because we were working together on GPM, he was able of supporting us. And this kind of support comes from this kind of, of gathering and institutions. And also like Mayor Braga, Mayor Rio from Braga, not related to the pandemic, but also when he saw a crisis that I was facing, because my city has got like 450,000 inhabitants, but we don't have like a, a firefighting uh, body. So Mayor Rio understood the challenge that I had, and he offered to Kelmane municipality a fire fighting car. So it's like this kind of international gathering as GPM brings uh, alternative ways of solving challenges that we do face, be it on a bilateral level, but also as a multilateral and multi-level action. And also, you know, I could bring my own experience as an ICLE, uh also member that you know through ICLA, through GPM, through COMSA and through uh, UCLG we have been discussing about strategies on how best they will do we maximize the role and advantage that mayors do have to solve this kind of problem because mayors have got two main advantages. One, we are elected by people who know us unlike national government who, right, you know, the decisions we take affect people on their daily basis. So they understand us, they recognize us, and actually they legitimize us more, I think, than national government. And second is the issue of proximity. We are there. When things happen, we are there. I could give the example of Kelimane City when we are faced with the cyclone uh, spread in May, on the 12th of May this year. But I could give also the example of the Beira city, where for five full days, the mayor of, the, I mean, is now the deceased, the former mayor of Beira, he could not receive support either by sea, by air, by car, by road, or by rail, because the rails were damaged by, by, by the cyclone. Because of the weather, no ship could be there, or no plane could land, and the, no cars could come. So, he had to deal with own resource. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, the line was cut. So I hope we find Mayor Araujo again. Let me uh, go to the next question, which is a very interesting one. It's rather uh, addressed at um, experts such as Professor Kigbush and, and Professor Katz. Um, at the WHO, 
So there's not only, oh, you're back, Mayor. But if you don't mind, Mayor Arosha, I'm just going to the next question because time is already over um, very soon. Um, there's not only a pandemic treaty that is being discussed by states, um, but there are also other mechanisms, um, including one of them being the Universal Health and Preparedness Review, UHPR, which is a state-led peer review mechanism that aims to establish a dialogue among member states to discuss national capacity for health emergency preparedness. Um, both of you, I think, have mentioned that capacity for health emergency preparedness often is an issue for local and regional governments. So how can we provide more space for cities, for local and regional governments in that new mechanism called the Universal Health and Preparedness Review? Um, sorry, I'm not sure who wants to respond, either Professor Kickbush or Katz. Oh, I guess I'll, I'll I'll jump in and then uh, and then Dr. Kickbush can correct me. I I think I think you're right. I mean, there's there's UHPR, there is the National Action Plans for Health Security, the NAPS process, there is the JEE, the Joint External Evaluations, as well as the SPAR that are associated with the international health regulations. There's a lot of assessments that are happening. There's also assessments on um, on the animal health side through PVS. Um, there is a, a yet another assessment tool um, specifically related to outbreaks called 717. So there, there, are, there are a plethora of assessments. Um, I mention all of these in part because they are all mentioned in relevance to the new pandemic fund set up by the World Bank and the WHO um, as ways to both uh, identify need and also um, look for um, and, and, and prove success in funding. So I, I think what I would mention on all these is that there are, there are, most of these tools now have a language in them that include the importance of subnational capacity. Um, it's, it's wiggle room. It's a space that um, mayors and other subnational leaders haven't necessarily traditionally engaged in these processes. But there, the, the language in there provides an opportunity to, to almost elbow one's way in, right? To, to be able to, 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 to emphasize the things that you've all been speaking about today. And when you know that your country is having a national action plan for health security and that they have to address subnational authorities, that there might be an opportunity there to, to kind of push for engagement. So that, that, that's, that's a, one, one thought. But again, I'll, I'll go to Dr. Kikush. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you, uh, Rebecca, because I'd like to reiterate that, that uh, now there is a window of opportunity. The language is there, but the practice is not really there. And I think there is the tendency as delegations and evaluators and I don't know what go to countries, they will stay at the level of the capital. Maybe they meet the mayor of the capital, uh, they will stay at the level even very frequently of the Ministry of Health and not uh, be able to talk to many other ministries very often, even though, again, you know, the whole of um, whole of government and whole of society issue is reiterated. So I think the pilots right now uh, for the universal health reviews are really important. And I think what we're moving towards is also, you know, okay, these are pandemic reviews, but the issues that are important for pandemics, in many cases, think of, you know, having enough funds to establish a good public health authority and system within your city has a consequence for so many other of the health issues faced. And again, if you look at it through uh, the One Health Eyes and you know certain surveillance capacities, uh, then you know these resources that either come in through pandemics, because uh, that's where the money is or was, or if they come in other diseases. We know that many of the polio resources finally were highly important for the pandemic response. Nobody had thought of that when you had established them, 
But yes, they were there. There was a surveillance system. There were people who were trained to go out into the community. And I was thrilled to hear that uh, the mayor said he himself went from door to door. I just wish more people in the countries that I know well had gone from door to door to establish trust in uh, the political system, in the public health infrastructure. So I think I'd really like to reiterate that. And you, Major Aunt, you, Mayor Aunt, you said uh, the, the issue around the social context that is really the critical issue of, of cities. And it was the social context that the cities had to deal with, with loneliness, with you know a whole range of things. Just think of all the mental health issues that are now coming, the violence, all of those things, which are not per se you know, financed through a pandemic fund, but have to be financed through other me mechanisms. And so I think, you know, exploring the use of this window of opportunity as new mechanisms are established, I think mayors should be very, very loud uh, and, uh, and make that very clear. Because both, you know, the social context they establish will help solve pandemic issues and the way they deal with the social context that comes through a pandemic think of the populist responses uh, is uh, is something that is of relevance to the whole political climate of a country. So I really, really think uh, mayors have a tremendous opportunity and might I say so, a tremendous responsibility uh, to actually take this forward. If I can just say one more sentence from uh, the WHO side, one thing that is also happening is reaching out to parliamentarians because there's another element here. If we go towards a pandemic accord treaty or whatever we're going to call it, the, it has to be ratified. So parliamentarians have to understand what all this is about. For example, that it's not a loss of sovereignty, one of the issues that is continuously being pushed forward against the treaty. We won't be able to decide our own destiny if WHO comes in and rules us all. So it, there needs to be a briefing of parliamentarians. And again, many mayors were or will become parliamentarians. So I think working on that, you could really contribute significantly uh, to not only a narrow, narrow pandemic agenda, but the broader health agenda. And if I go to Mayor Rio, yes, cities do have a health responsibility, even if it's not health services. You yourself said so. It's the living conditions in cities that keep help keep people healthy. Urban planning does so, and schools do it. And so cities should say, look, we are health champions. We actually want to keep people out of health services. We want to keep them healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kickbush. And these are perfect concluding remarks, actually, about the role of cities in terms of, as you said, health at large, not only health services, but uh, health responsibility. And I really like the fact that you underline now is an opportunity to be seized. And that's, I think, I think what we are trying to do with this declaration of mayors is to provide more visibility to mayors, to their voices, to their work on the ground, to basically respond, prevent, prepare the next pandemic, because there probably will be a next pandemic. So let me here um, thank all speakers, all our very distinguished panelists. Thank you for sharing uh, all your experiences, all your expertise so genuinely. I hope this event was useful to all those who listen. And I hope it's only a start of a conversation or a continuation, as you said, because work has already started a few years ago, but we need to continue this work and make sure that mayors' voices are heard loud and clear at the international level um, by states um, who currently negotiate those different instruments. Thank you, everyone. We wish you a very, very good summer. Thank you again to the Global Parliament of Mayors with, which, with whom we have very closely collaborated on this event and have a good afternoon, morning, day, wherever you are. Thank you so much.
Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.